You're listening to the Mind Over Murder podcast. My name is Bill Thomas. I'm a writer, consulting producer, and now podcaster. I am now trying to use my experience as the brother of a murder victim to help other victims of violent crime. I'm working on a book on the unsolved Colonial Parkway murders, and I'm the co-administrator of the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook group, together with Kristen Dilley. My name is Kristen Dilley. I'm a writer, a researcher, a teacher, and a victim's advocate, as well as the social media manager and co-administrator for the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook page with my partner in crime, Bill Thomas. You're listening to the Mind Over Murder podcast. Welcome to Mind Over Murder. I'm Kristen Dilley. And I'm Bill Thomas. We're joined today by Dr. Katherine Ramslin, forensic psychologist, professor, author, and all around awesome person. Dr. Ramslin, welcome to Mind Over Murder. Thank you for joining us. I'm very happy to be here. I'm excited about your questions and ready to go. Let's go ahead and start by having you tell our listeners about your extensive professional background, both as a teacher and a writer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it covers a lot of years. I actually just got a contract for my 70th book. Wow. And I have two, three others in motion. A writer is what I am, even though I'm also a professor of forensic psychology. But I've also been a philosophy professor. I taught at Rutgers University for 15 years teaching philosophy. I've been a lot of different odd things, but mostly I think my heart is in writing and that is what I spend every free moment doing, writing and traveling and researching. So that would cover basically everything. I have five graduate degrees. (laughs) I just got one last year, an MFA in creative writing where we went to Ireland uh, and we are going to Scotland, even though I already have the degree, criminal justice, forensic psychology, clinical psychology, philosophy. Oh my gosh. I like to learn. Wow. That's incredible. Oh my goodness. So you did talk about you're working on your 70th book, which is incomprehensible to me. I can barely get one finished, much less <laughs> 70. So it would be impossible to just list all of these publications. But what are some of the ones that you have most enjoyed writing, either because of the subject matter or because of the process? Ugh, it's hard to pick, <laughs> but certainly the one I wrote that came out in 2020, How to Catch a Killer, took th- cases of 30 serial killers and categorized them according to the things that had worked to catch them. So one was forensic innovation, police procedure, mistakes they made, witnesses, and those that turned themselves. That was very interesting. I love the book that I wrote for one of my classes. I teach a psychology of death investigation course, and I have taught for 20 years and finally wrote the textbook for it. So I talk a lot about the different procedures that involve psychological analysis. Profiling is the one most people know, but psychological autopsy is the one I like best because that is where the psychologist really gets to be a detective in many ways. And then part of it also involves teamwork. So I have the students work on cases and we have a crime scene house where we lay things out. They have to figure out the clues, et cetera. So that's a lot of fun. And then the fiction has been fun as well. I have a three book deal for a fictional series with a forensic psychologist who operates her own private investigation agency Mm. in the Carolinas, by the way, (laughs) because I love the Outer Banks. So I think that way I can go to the Outer Banks tax deductible anytime I want to. (laughs) That's a great idea. (laughs) It's all research. And she also, a lot of weather stuff involved in that because I love weather. So we have forensic meteorologists involved, dog handlers, things like that. I'm having a blast doing that because it's all stuff that I really do based on actual cases that are really bizarre. So that's been a lot of fun. The first one comes out in August and I'm already almost done with the second one. So what's your title for the first book in the series? It's called, you actually almost have to see it. It's called Ice Cream Man, but it's I Scream Man. <laughs> and, okay, everybody make a note of this. I love it. I Scream Man will come out in August 2022. That's right. That's awesome. I hope we're not being too tough on you with this question. 
So for <laughs> the Mind Over Murder listeners who are very interested in learning, which book of your 69, almost 70 books should they start with? What's a good introduction for someone who wants to learn more about you and the work that you've I have written one called The Criminal Mind. You can still get that in an e-form. And that's covering forensic psychology for writers, but it does give an overview of the kinds of things forensic psychologists do. Also, I think the one that I spent the most time on that has been very intensive is the book I did with the BTK serial killer, Dennis Rader. Oh, yeah. That was five years in the making. I've never spent so much time on a book as I did with that one. And that then also became a four-part documentary on A&E. And I was an executive producer watching a book that had that kind of unusual, it's, it was called a guided autobiography. So he's telling mm -hmm. his story, but it's guided through my clinical background because I wanted to extract from him insights for criminology, forensic psychology, and law enforcement. That's an unusual vision right off yeah. the bat, but then to watch this become a documentary holding that vision is a writer's dream. That's what every writer wants to see. And the team that pitched themselves to me to do this got it. And I've had many people not get it, but they got it. It wasn't from the point of view of the investigators, which is the typical thing in the BTK case. This is from his point of view and the people he affected through this. So it was a real sense of Wichita, Kansas, where he committed his 10 murders, a real sense of how he impacted people there. We talked to the DA, who was actually a friend of mine before I ever even started the book. So she was very good about sharing things with me. Talk to cops who had been involved, talk to victim family members. So it was quite a lot of work. I will say that, oh, yeah. especially because we were filming in August in Kansas in 100 Ooh. plus degree mm. all day long. <laughs> it's Ooh. really intense, but I really enjoyed that whole process. Wow. In addition to the writing, I know that you teach as well. You're a teacher and assistant provost at DeSales University. What do you teach? And then what traits do you look for in a successful student of forensic psychology? That question actually has inspired me to write a blog, All right, yay. <laughs> which will be coming up this week because I had to really think about that idea of the successful student in this particular field. Yeah. Because I have had recently, I've had student candidates who've been asking me, what can they do with this, et cetera. At any rate, I basically I run the forensic track at the undergraduate level and also in the master's program in criminal justice. So I'm in psychology and criminal justice, undergraduate and graduate. I teach a basic forensic psychology class, a death investigation class, because I do death investigation stuff with local coroners. And then, of course, on extreme offenders, mass murderers, spree killers, serial killers. So they get the whole range there. And then those kind of get repackaged as graduate courses at a more advanced level. So that's what I teach. But now that I'm assistant provost, it, teaching is half time and administrative mm -hmm. stuff is all the rest. When I'm watching students, the first thing that I think I like to see is the idea of a lifelong learner who's curious who wants to learn things, who isn't just going to school to get it over with or go through the motions or because they can't think of anything else to do, but they're there because it's what they really want to do and they can't wait to dive in and they're so excited about whatever books are being, they're asked to read or papers they're asked to write and they'll bring things into it. So that idea of the lifelong learner, the curious mm -hmm. person is most important. And one of the things I think students really have a huge hurdle with these days, thanks largely to media, is focus. Because we, and even I have experienced social media has taken a lot of my ability to focus. I used to be able to write for hours at a time, and now it's very choppy. And many of the students I teach have come up on this stuff. They've been trained through Sesame Street, actually starting all the way back there, where the camera angles are always very choppy and fast. That affects your brain. And so the ability to focus is really difficult for them. And if they put their mind to it, they can do it. But that would be one, another thing that I would definitely look for. And then someone who's confident enough to want to step out on their own, be self-reliant in a way, I think I would love to see more of that. But it's tough because they've just been through this pandemic 
yeah. where they disengage, were asked to learn in a way that they've never done before. And now we're asking them to come right back in and re-engage. So there's a lot of challenges right now for college students. But I still think the ones who have a sense of self-reliance and curiosity and a sense of purpose, they can set goals. Those are the ones that are going to succeed. Are you back at DeSales University? Are you back within We were always here. Learning? We, we, were, we just spent millions of dollars fixing our classrooms into oh. <laughs> socially distant teas and doing much more hybrid kinds of classes. Now, I've been teaching online for years, so that wasn't any big leap for me to do. But no, the students wanted to be back on campus. So yeah, we had a lot of rules in place, masking up, social distancing, and we were back on campus almost right away. Oh, wow. Was it successful? Were people able to stay healthy? Mostly parties. Right. That's where the discipline begins to fall apart, I think particularly when you're dealing with young people. I stayed healthy, so I'm happy about that. <laughs> Although, it's funny, Kristen and I talked about this. The three of us saw each other at CrimeCon, which was yeah. not a safe environment. No. And we know no. dozens of people that came home from CrimeCon with COVID. We weren't as careful as we normally are. Yeah. So it does happen. And if you remember, I walked up to you with the mask on. I and did. You, had, you had, was it the blood spatter mask or what? There was uh, BTK uh, mask. One of okay. Yeah. Killers on it. Yeah. I got that from a, the Savannah Crime Expo the year before. And That's right. Thought, well, that. an appropriate one to wear. So, yes. Yeah. <laughs> no, absolutely. But you were one of the few people that I saw. And, yeah, I know. and Kristen and I are usually very disciplined in our own lives. But there, I just felt, oh, here we go. No one else, is, for the most part, no one else was wearing a mask except for Dr. Ramsland, of course, the smartest person in the room. The rest of us, I just threw my hands up in the air. And it wasn't very smart, quite frankly, but I did. I think it was hard to, to make a decision because if you're yeah. trying to engage with people, especially if you want them to walk up to your tables, I didn't have that yes, issue. Yes, we you did. You had that issue. If you want people to walk up to your table, you want to seem warm, open, as there's a lot of politics involved, mm-hmm. to choose and or choose not to wear masks. And so you're trying to be as inviting to everybody as possible. So I think it was a very difficult thing. I don't know that I would have had a table in a circumstance like that myself, but I was able to stay away from where crowded things happen. I didn't eat in restaurants. I really stayed away from stuff. So I think that was helpful. And even on the elevator, I had people appreciating when they'd see me masked up. Thank you. Because on an elevator, obviously you're trapped in a small space and I just figured, who cares? I'll do what I want to do. Yeah, for us, because it was our first time with our Mind Over Murder podcast on Podcast Row, we'd been there as participants, but we'd never presented our little podcast. And also, both of us wanted to be recognized. Oh, yes. hey, Kristen, hey, Bill, that kind of thing. We felt was so important. We were discussing it at length beforehand. What are we going to do? We're usually so careful. It's even Mm -hmm. still difficult because I was just at the Writers Police Academy conference. That's a lot of hands-on stuff, four days. Yeah, it's still difficult to know what to do. And in that situation, same thing, you were careful, you stayed I was as careful as I could be, but you're in closed spaces, you're in hotels, you're eating. We had group breakfasts and I tried to sit away from people, but of course I was one of the speakers. So they wanted to come and talk to me. You can't have your mask on while you're eating. So there are always going to be those situations. So so far it worked. (laughs) And at DeSales, you've managed to make it work without having the students go back home or whatever. You stayed on campus. We stayed on campus We ser- and we had constant monitoring. We had a random selection where we had to go get tested, oh, wow. professors and students. So you never knew to be singled out and you had to go today to get tested. We had, if a student tested positive or was near somebody, we'd get messages and then we'd have to add Zoom into our classes so that student could come mm-hmm. in on Zoom, that they would be quarantined. We actually rented hotel rooms to quarantine students. Oh, wow. So we did. A, we spent a lot of money. We did a lot to accommodate their desire to be on campus. But yeah, it's tough. Do you feel like it was maybe easier for them because they did not have to transition from home to back to school? Do you feel like they maybe had an easier time than other college students I, I might don't, have? 
You know, I don't think so because <laughs> social distancing, they want to be on campus because they want to have that campus experience. And then we're right. saying, oh, but six feet apart, masks up. I don't know that they actually did personally. I think mm. it was still, I think it was still a challenging time. I think it still continues to be a challenging time yeah. for sure. So you talked a little bit already about working on the documentary about BTK, but I know you do other work with the television industry, both as a as an executive producer, a consultant, an on-screen expert. So what are some of the other productions that you've either worked on recently or have worked on in the past that you particularly enjoyed? Thanks for the question, because I'm so excited about Murder House Flip. <laughs> that was my idea, came out of one of my classes, and I pitched it to one of my buddies at Sony, and they, and then we went all over the place pitching, and everyone thought this is such a great idea. We had a sizzle reel, we did all kinds of fun things, but it still took some time, and then the pandemic. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Just as we were getting season one underway, the pandemic happened, and killed the per- the first network that picked it up. It got picked up again. So season two is coming out in August. I'm so excited about it. We have six houses that we redid, including the Jody Arias house. Oh, wow. Which was stunning because they had not really cleaned that up, that murder site. When we picked up a rug, there was still blood. Oh, my gosh. You that- are kidding That place was never professionally cleaned? Apparently not. And that's not the only one. We had another one where a guy had dismembered his wife in the shower. Wow. And they basically arrest him while he's cooking her on the stove. And so this young couple comes along and finds this pretty little blue house overlooking the ocean at a great price. And they buy it and find out it's the blue murder house. Oh my and God. so when we went in and pulled up floor tiles and there was blood still. Holy smokes. So I guess yeah. when you find that amazing, phenomenal house with the price too good to be true. Just be ready. I think still buy it, but just be ready that there's going to be some creepy stuff. And then call us. Great <laughs> renovation for the murder site. <laughs> I was wow. wondering how people might feel from a real estate perspective. Would they really want their house featured on your television series? Oh you wouldn't believe how popular this is. And they get a really beautiful, expensive renovation for free. There is that. Yeah. Now Plus, we have not really had any trouble with that. And most of them, aside from Jody Arias' house, have been in California because of the expense of travel and all the COVID restrictions and whatnot. But it really hasn't been that hard to find houses. What There are laws in place for if a murder has happened, but after three years, no longer in place. So people can buy houses and not know they have a murder house. And then they find out and they know something's creepy about that spot. Yeah. They do want a completely new look to it, and they love it. Everyone's but, been really happy with all the work we did, and I just love the idea. I think it's such a cool idea. It's like the coolest mashup ever. Pamela, my partner, and I are both really into all the home renovation shows. Me and, too. And we have an old house, and we continually work on it. So we watch all these things at night. And then we're also true crime fans, me more so than Pamela. This is like the perfect mashup it of is. true crime and real estate slash old home fix. And I can see how this is so brilliant. You think to yourself, how come no one else ever thought of this? And I've had it pitched to me since then by big production companies. And I've said, it is a good idea. And we're already doing it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not anyone who has a Roku device. Just go to the Roku originals and you see it for free. It's, and it's amazing. It's really fun and interesting. So so do you our, do first, our first house was the Dorothy Puente house where she had buried seven bodies in the yard. Wow. And the people did not want renovation because they the house was cool with historic value and whatnot. And they but I said, Oh, I bet you want a new yard. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> and they got a beautiful pergola and all kinds of really cool stuff in their yard. Wow. So do you do an overview of the case of what yes. has happened at the house and the issue? crime? and design brought wow. together. So you get first the case. Sometimes we find the original detective and interview them. In a couple of cases, we've had forensic people come in, like the blood uh, luminol. We had a guy come in and do that to make sure. And then after you get the sense of the case, we bring our two designers in. They talk about, oh, what would they do? And then they do it. And then you get <laughs> well, the big reveal to the owners, very similar to the flip shows. 
Now, we didn't flip them. We're actually doing makeovers because we didn't buy these houses. Right. But it's still the same idea that they leave and our people completely redo it and do beautiful stuff. I love this idea. Murder House Flip. And it's yeah. available on Roku and I'm sure online as well. Wow. So that's a fantastic idea. <laughs> we, we're both sold. We're there. <laughs> yeah. So we had talked to you a little bit about this before. You're a regular contributor to Psychology Today magazine. What are some of the topics that you've covered that were important to you? Okay, so about 11 years ago, Psychology Today, the magazine, asked me to be one of the bloggers, and there's a lot of them who are on the site. So you're really on the website coming up with blogs, and they asked me to choose a theme. So I chose shadow boxing because dark stuff is my thing. And for the past 10 years, I've been writing... I think I have well over 500 blogs on that site right now. Wow. I might write about suicide because that's one of my mm -hmm. special areas. I might write about kids who kill because that's also something I study a lot. I might write about, I certainly write about serial colors, people who want to be Ted Bundy. That's a popular feature. I've done that yeah. three times because there's a lot of people who want to be Ted Bundy. Her murderabilia collectors was a recent one. Right. I look at cold cases. I look at cognitive issues in investigation. There's so many different things. That, oh, paranormal stuff mm -hmm. I do. And that's one of the things that my Annie Hunter, my character, will do. She'll take on cases where there are paranormal dimensions just because she's a debunker. She, but, okay. And yet she's like not, that. she's open. Okay, I'm first going to eliminate <laughs> everything. But if there's something, I'm open to it. So I talk a lot about those kinds of things as well, because this is fun. I, do, I have a book called Haunted Crime Scenes, which is a lot of fun to do. In fact, that's going to be part of the Savannah Crime Expo this year. Oh, great. <laughs> We're looking forward to yeah. seeing you there. My, my co-writer is going to be there. I'm the scully of the team. They work with psychics and all this stuff. And I'm like, okay, prove it to me. <laughs> I like it. And this Annie Hunter, is there any chance that she's a petite, blonde, full degree <laughs> psychologist by <laughs> chance yeah, with, and she's a podcaster as and, as well. very interesting her podcast is called psy apps I, instead of okay. psy ops I, I like it i have no idea where you get your ideas i really don't it's like they come out of the ether somehow it was actually i will tell you it was during a pitch to a showtime crew and they turned down the pitch but then they said why are you writing what you do <laughs> Yeah, you do all kinds of cool stuff. Why aren't I? Yeah. You said, oh, yeah, in my copious free time, I think I'll do that. <laughs> all of my time is taken up with whatever I'm writing, because why not? That's, what, that's my life. It's what I do. I love it. You're listening to Mind Over Murder. We'll be right back after this word from our sponsors. We're back here at Mind Over Murder. I was trying to figure out, like, when do you sleep? You've written 70 books. I don't know how you... But I do, because I think sleep and exercise are very important to being able to be productive. So, yes, oh. I do. I definitely do. I know. Kristen and I are both still trying to get our <laughs> first book done. But what's your book? Mine, no surprise, will be the story of the Colonial Parkway murders. And Kristen's also working on a book, and I love her idea as well. Mine is called Battle Scars, and it is about the surviving victims of crime and how they cope and how they ultimately get through the struggle of what happens once you have lived with murder and its consequences. And so that's how I got to know Bill, is I cold called him and said, I'd like to interview you for my book. Good idea. Yeah, it's a great I idea. I think it's a good idea. And I'm, yeah. School just ended. So Kristen has a little yes. more time now. I, I do need to do some writing. Yes. Yeah. 100%. So, 100%. But then she and I have 12 other things going on, all of them very exciting. So we're going to try to figure out how to do them all this summer. I get it. But it's really about managing your time. And it is. for me, I can't not write. Yes, ma'am. I you understand know? that. It just flows. I have to sit right down first thing, start writing. Yeah. I love that. I definitely understand that. So you had sent me a blog post that I particularly liked, and it was from May 2021, and it was titled The Number One Blunder of True Crime Sleuths, which is a great title anyway. 
because we are victims advocates and we're experts in the Colonial Parkway murders and we do have to field tips on the regular, this was particularly interesting to us. So tell us what the biggest blunder is that citizen sleuths make when they investigate a true crime. It's a tricky title because there's several Mm -hmm. mistakes all wrapped up into one. But the first thing that this is about is the notion that logic equals truth. Logic is a trickster. It's just a tool, but it makes you feel good. If you can build a case that just feels like it's got all that closure you need, then it feels like it must be right. But that's really just playing a trick on the brain because the brain always seeks closure. It always seeks coherence and consistency, which is not to say accuracy. And one of the problems then becomes, and this, by the way, isn't just amateur sleuths. Cops are also prone to this as well. I was looking for, I know a lot about cognitive errors, like confirmation bias and whatnot. You hear that all over the place. And I kept, I was talking to this cognitive psychologist and saying, got to be one where you think you've got all the facts of a case. And so you build your idea on it and you're wrong. (laughs) You don't have all the facts. And so you've built a wrong idea, but you don't know what is that. And she said, I don't know. I don't know. (laughs) And then I was reading Daniel Kahneman, the foremost cognitive psychologist in the world, and there it was, Wiziati is how he describes it, Wiziati. What is all there is? And that is something that true crime sleuths are very prone to, not Mm -hmm. necessarily of their fault. It's because the human brain is always reaching for closure. It does not like ambiguity. It does not like things open-ended. And so... What is all there is, or wiziati, is the idea that you've done your work, you've collected your facts, and you think you've got them all, but you might be wrong. And we're actually seeing that right now with many people revisiting some of the old narratives. And what's happening is those people who bought the old narratives are resisting any new stuff. I think the John Wayne Gacy case is a good example. This idea that this sex trafficker, John David Norman, might have been part of what was going on and that John Wayne Gacy actually had accomplices who never got charged by the police. And I've seen people who think they are experts on Gacy say, that's just not true. None of that's true. Oh, we have facts. There are things out there that prove, but that's what's happening. People who cling to the old narratives have that wiziati thing. What I see is all there is. Those narratives must yield to new evidence. They must yield to new evidence and we have to rebuild them. And sometimes the new evidence isn't new evidence. It's just a new way of looking at the case, new logic. So I think Jack the Ripper is a great example. You asked me about a case and I think Jack the Ripper is one of the best. I think I'm the Ripperologist of the Lehigh Valley anyway. I read a book of 333 suspects for Jack the Ripper and they didn't even have them all. I immediately thought of two more that weren't in the book. Every single one of those people who proposes their suspect believes they have exactly the right one. Books like Case Closed and blah, blah, blah. Right, and they're very definitive. They have, yeah, they've spun the narrative logically in a way that they have made sense out of it. But boy, if you look at it closely, every one of those narratives takes logically. I've been at Whitechapel several times and I've seen... We might not even have a Jack the Ripper who killed those five, the canonical five, as we call them. I think a couple of them don't even belong in the mix for a variety of reasons. Very interesting. Uh, And that there are others who were not considered for a variety of reasons who might well be considered if we change a little bit about the way we look at this case. So Jack the Ripper is a great case. The Zodiac is another one. How many suspects do we have for Zodiac? So many. I think every day I hear someone say, oh, we've solved that one. And no, uh -uh, we have not. But if somebody owns it, there's this emotional investment. I've researched this more than anybody else. So I know, I know the facts. And unfortunately, your emotional investment is not a guarantee that you have the true story or the right suspect. And so what's going on with now add in podcasting, 
no offense to anyone, but add in podcasting, you have the pressure on because people want their podcast to stand out. They want to be the one who solved it. So yep. what, what happens, is, and I know you guys have had people approach you about the ones that, that you're very involved in. What happens is you get these debates, you get people digging in. It's very much like our political scene today. You get people digging in, you get some shallow thinking, you get some deeper thinking, many logical leaps to make a case. And that's that's why I chose actually the blog that I sent you, the Elisa Lamb case. I thought the documentary in the Cecil Hotel was fabulous in that it showed the all these amateur sleuths who went into the hotel over and over. They were sure they're going to solve it. It was such a bizarre case. She disappears and there's footage in an elevator of her looking. There's a ghost following her. That's yeah. one of the theories or that she found a hole in the security system and slipped out or that somebody murdered her and stashed her in a room and they identified a suspect and they contacted that person and they were all over him to the point where he was suicide and he was not the guy. He did not do anything. He didn't even know her. But the logic and the ownership and the emotional investment converged in that case where people were just nuts about their own theory. And they just, she had to have been murdered or she had to have been whatever. And even the police response by the end, they missed a lot of stuff. But by the end, the I guess it was the coroner's judgment, I thought was wrong. Like, I think it still remains undetermined because I think it could have easily been suicide. But they have accidental drowning. I don't think so. <laughs> that was a, a little too weird. But even I don't know that I'm right either because there are big holes. What happens is our brain fills in the holes to make it satisfying to us. And that's, I think people have to learn mindfulness about their approach. And they can do that by teaming up with someone who can point out, oh, you tend to jump to conclusions really fast. So maybe you want to think a little, get some perspective on this. So they could team up with someone or they could just do a practice of looking at a case from multiple angles and not just their favorite one. So there, there are things that I do and I teach in my courses to try to avoid this instant closure, this urgency and permanence mm -hmm. that settle in with people who have what we find to be a high need for closure. And a high need for closure is a personality trait. A lot of police officers have it because they're attracted to law enforcement for right. that versus wrong, law and order, good versus evil kind of idea about law enforcement. They're attracted to because they already have that sense of things are simple. And they want to put bad guys in jail. And they want to put bad guys in jail kind of and mentality. be. Yeah, exactly. We're seeing this in the Colonial Parkway murders where yes. investigators get so locked into a certain theory. And unfortunately, these are key players in the investigation. Mm -hmm. And when we bring them information, which we think is at least worth checking out regarding other suspects, they'll respond with, oh, we'll put that in the file. And now after years of this, we realize that's code for, we're literally going to put it in a desk drawer and never deal with it because we're right. locked into so on. And they still can't prove that their leading suspect is the right one. So I was glad to hear you say that law enforcement investigators can fall into these same traps. Certainly. And there are programs training police officers about cognitive errors like this to help them not fall into those traps. And those programs are devised by other cops who have seen it happen to them. And they have worked with psychologists to devise exercises training to help younger officers avoid the trap of some of these errors. But I was very struck by something you said a moment ago, Catherine, which is we were talking about the Elisa Lamb case, which obviously had great elements of mystery and it had been hyped up and that sort of thing. But even when you said a moment ago that you believe this could be an accidental drowning or a suicide, then the next thing you said was, but I could be wrong. And I don't hear that very often with yeah. the investigators that we've worked with, particularly in the Colonial Parkway murders. They get very definitive and they don't want to look at anything that's outside their narrow focus. Second guessing someone is to that, to their mind is tantamount to saying they're wrong. 
and that's not, that doesn't go over. It, it's difficult. My training's in philosophy. I was a philosophy professor, so I can float <laughs> with ambiguity. But right. you need to be trained in that to be able to do it. And I don't find many investigators able to do it unless they've had some kind of training and awareness of mistakes made. That's why I think some of these who are out there devising the programs who have made these mistakes are the best teachers because they're in law enforcement and they saw what they did. They saw the assumptions they made. They saw that they went down the wrong path and landed on the wrong suspect and harmed somebody's life. And then they had to admit, where did they go wrong? What were their blind spots? And that's not easy for anybody to do, but in particular, not someone with a high need for closure. You mentioned Jack the Ripper, of course, and Elisa Lamb. Are there some other cases that you can think of that seem to be stymied, like under the weight of too many competing theories and too many sleuths? Zodiac for sure. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> I had somebody tell me that BTK is a Zodiac killer and she wanted a book. That was her mindset was she was going to, and here were her reasons why she was right. And all of them were ridiculous. All of them. She nevertheless got a self-published book. She got a book out of it because she was certain she had made a good logical case. Like For example, he was in the Air Force. So even though he was overseas during the Zodiac killings, he could have gotten on a plane and flown over there and committed the murders and gone right back to his base with nobody okay. knowing what was going on. And the reason he hasn't admitted to them and added them to his list, which would, by the way, make him ultra famous, which is what he wants, the reason he hasn't done that is because he's afraid for his soul. Okay, I have talked to him and you have not. He's not afraid for his soul. You've so, spent hours with the man. Years with the man. Yeah. And she has never met him, but her theory was this is the reason he hasn't copped to the Zodiac murders. Like, where did that come from? Yeah. Because she needed something to fill in the hole. And that was a convenient way to fill in the hole. It's wrong. But it made logical sense to her. So it worked. That takes and a I lot of that, I see that a lot. But even I think the Colonial Parkway, as we took this on for our haunted crime scenes weekend, and we immediately saw just setting people up for confirmation bias by the very name. Colonial Parkway oh, murders and, and, and Colonial I've, Parkway serial killer. You're setting people up to think in a certain way. Yes. And then you dig into the case and go, when did this happen? And I have said on Mind Over Murder in more recent months, and I think this has made some people uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I have to say something. I am personally responsible for promoting the term Colonial Parkway murders, as is Kristen, although I'm putting more of the blame on myself. In this example, I have a longer history. We've promoted that name, not with a commercial bent. We're just, we know that the eight families have more leverage together than we do apart. But now, interestingly, I've been saying more publicly in the last year or two, I would say, yeah, yeah. that the more I learn, the less convinced I am that the Colonial Parkway murders are actually a murder series. And I think without question, in my mind, and I could be wrong, I'm pretty certain that some or all of the Colonial Parkway murders will fall off the table. In other words, they're not all related. And there's obviously things that we know that we can't necessarily talk about on the podcast. But I actually said recently on our podcast that I think the phrase Colonial Parkway murders is the biggest rabbit hole of all because it's actually not helpful. These murders need to be looked at individually and they may be related but I don't think so. And until you know what happened to the missing couple, yes, there's sure. nothing you can do yes. with that. Absolutely. Keith Call and Cassandra Haley's disappearance is looked at as part of a murder series. I think given the fact that they've been gone for over 30 years, they're not coming back tomorrow. I do think they were murdered, but is it related to the others? I don't know. And if, even if they're murdered, how are they murdered? Is it the same? Is it different? Where are the bodies? What happened to them? All of that matters in terms of profiling. Wanted to, to string these together. You need to have more about them in the mix. And you can't just dump them in there because they were a couple. Right. I've seen people do. And it's interesting. We've had somebody contact us recently who, and this has happened before, but this particular gentleman is very passionate about this. And he's a smart guy. He thinks the Zodiac and the Colonial Parkway case are related, that they are the same killer. And it's not the first time we've heard it. It's, 
it seems like a long shot. We get it a lot. <laughs> then it's got to be Dennis Rader. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Let's throw Jack the Ripper in there and H.H. H. Holmes while we're at it, since he's the great grandson of Jack the Ripper. Oh, now Dennis Rader. Where is Dennis Rader, by the way? Dennis Rader is in El Dorado Maximum Security Prison. In fact, I just spoke to him a couple of days ago. I was going to say, if you needed wow. to run something past him, you probably could. Oh, we were not laughing about the Zodiac thing on Sunday, as a matter of fact. There you go. <laughs> you asked already. Is he, because it started with somebody calling him and telling him that the graves of Dick Hickok and Perry Smith were in Florida. Oh, f- and those are the clutter killer, the yeah. two clutter killers. And I said, no, they're not. They're not. Kansas. <laughs> no, this woman told me they're in Florida and that they were dug up to prove that they were the killers of this other family in 1959. Was, oh, my God. I said, well, first of all, no, <laughs> is that where their graves are? Secondly, that whole case has nothing to do with them. Mm-hmm. That was another case of putting together some logic and making, oh, they were in Florida and they killed a family of four. So that makes sense that they must have done this other one. And so all of the logical leaps were made to make them be at the scene, even though they never, they said themselves they never were. But then, okay, but they, and they said under a polygraph they never were. So then it became polygraphs during the 1960s weren't yeah. any good. Oh you know, gosh. always have the ambiguity factor to move things around. Oh, witnesses. Witnesses, are, in their memory, we know from research, isn't very good. Always have that ambiguity so that you can twist it to make your logic fit. And that is the number one problem for amateur sleuths <laughs> in cold case research is you're going to have holes and you're going to be tempted to fill those holes with logic and ideas that make a coherent story. And then you're going to believe the story because it feels right. And that feeling is the most misleading part of it. Does it ever make you frustrated when you talk to people like that who are just, okay, yes, but, okay, yes, but, here's why I'm right? Because that would infuriate me. I don't know how you do it. Well, it, do, it yes, it, in a way it does, but it doesn't because I know about cognitive psychology and the okay. human brain automatically moves in that direction. It just automatically wants those holes filled and it will create stuff. We know from jury research, if they don't hear things that they're li- listening for from one side or the other, when they go deliberate, they will fill in the holes themselves. We know that and not because they want to do a bad job it's because of the way the brain works so i think that knowledge helps me not to be frustrated but there does come a point where there's no reason to argue anymore have a good day signing off that's it for now oh geez especially if they really are so sure they're right that then it becomes there's no point in really having a discussion and those kind and i know you guys have experience this because you're Mm -hmm. in one of those cases where multiple people want to get at it and somebody wants to solve it. Multiple people want to solve it. True confessions. Before we signed on today, five minutes before we signed on, Kristen mentioned something to me about a guy who is insisting that he knows who committed the Colonial Parkway murders. Yeah. All of this is based on his psychic ability and nothing else. He hasn't provided us with a single, nothing meaningful. And we finally had to kick him off some of our Facebook pages. And now we're looking at maybe kicking him off our YouTube pages because he keeps insisting this man with no evidence is responsible for the murder of Donna Hall and Mike Margaret, which is another couple's homicide in 1984, a little bit before the Colonial Parkway murders over in Henrico County, Virginia, near Richmond. But this guy is just insisting that this former cop committed the murders with no evidence to back it up. And I'm not saying he is 100% wrong because I couldn't say that, but what's happening now is he's so insistent that other people now are asking us, what about this guy? What about this guy? His name keeps coming up. And as recently as last night, I was answering on social media and I was like, who is this guy? And I realized, oh yeah, this is the retired cop (laughs) that our oddball, I'll call him that, Keeps insisting. Nicer than what I was going to call him. Thank you. (laughs) Keeps insisting. And it's amazing how this stuff repeated ad nauseum begins to gain traction. People are like, what about someone? Shouldn't he be looked at? And we just spent two episodes. Especially if it's psychic. Yeah. That's Mm -hmm. special vision. We've just thrown our hands up in the air. What do we do with this 
information. And it I, isn't yeah. like he's providing us anything really meaningful that would indicate why this retired police officer should be looked at for these murders. No, He's probably done that thing of, I've read enough and I put it together logically. And now the patina of supernatural vision comes into play. I have a, I actually have a character called Monroe, the murder mentalist. We call, and he calls him 3M. <laughs> and he has that, but it's hard to tell whether he's a charlatan or he really has something but many followers because people love the idea that, and in fact, I'll say our Haunted Crime Scenes Weekend is about the idea that once you're at a standstill with regular things, can you bring in other kinds of methods that are not used by cops? And I think it's fun. But as I said, I'm the scully where I don't buy into it. And yet I've seen some interesting things where people doing automatic writing over here and something else over there. And they come together and have something similar that had nothing to do with any of the material we had in the case. That's interesting. Yeah, I'm open. I need a lot of proof. Sometimes people don't. We're going to wrap this episode and continue with Dr. Catherine Ramsland on our next episode of Mind Over Murder. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next time. Mind Over Murder is a production of Absolute Zero and Another Dog Productions. Our executive producers are Bill Thomas and Kristen Dilley. Our logo art is by Pamela Arnois. Our theme music is by Kevin McLeod. Mind Over Murder is distributed in partnership with Crawl Space Media. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. You can also follow our page on the Colonial Parkway Murders on Facebook. And finally, you can follow Bill Thomas on Twitter at BillThomas56. Thank you for listening to Mind Over Murder. <laughs>